I, I, I find quite, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. I, I was asked to speak on this topic about uh, five, what, five months, five months ago at Banda Utama, and uh, so there were a lot of questions there. <laughs> and then Bobby said, "Well, why don't you speak on speak on this in DGF?" Okay, I'll just just rehash what what I've spoken. And yesterday I got a call from uh, Sati Alam Buddhist Sambodhi. He said, I heard you are giving a talk on BGF on this. Can you give one thing said <laughs> some sense for it? So I think there's a there's a lot of uh, aging people, right? Uh, but uh, but age, I think you know, one of the first things that I learned when I came into touch with the Dharma was this phrase that really caught my mind. Uh, it says that the birth is a forward view of death. Birth is a forward view of death. And of course, if you understand rebirth, then death is a backward view of birth. <laughs> so that actually set me thinking. And, and, you know, so it actually erased all my whatever concepts or ideas I had about Buddhism, being, you know, superstitious, being just rituals, being just ceremonies. You know, those were days when I was a young man, <laughs> not what I am now. So that sets, sets, sets me on this path to understand what is this, uh, this dharma that, the, that the, the Buddha taught. The Buddha started by saying, birth is a forward view of, of death. All right? So of course, in between, there are other things. You've got birth, you've got old age, you've got sickness, and then you've got death. <laughs> okay? So today, we are not, I'm, I, I think I'm not going to sound gloomy. I'm not going to sound pessimistic. I think there's a, there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of good things in, in, uh, in the aging process. Now, um, just talking to some, some, some medical friends, and you know, the aging process actually starts from the day we are born. We are already aging, you know. Uh, even though medically they say age 25, that's where you know, your, your, your skin starts changing and that's where you, you actually start the aging process. But the moment we are, we are born, that's why they, they, they offer the cliche that, the, that birth is actually the forward view of death, right? But does that make us in a very you know, gloomy, very pessimistic approach towards life? No. Actually, on the contrary. Okay? So today I'm going to share with you uh, some, some very wonderful uh, teachings or sayings which we can get from primarily from the Pali Canon. But of course, there are also many other suttas from other traditions. But today I'll just look at some of the Pali Canon. A lot of good, uh, good references. And more important, perhaps, how do we, for example, uh, apply some of the Buddhist principles, Buddhist teachings, that we can uh, age uh, mindfully, some say age gracefully. <laughs> so let's see. So um, it's 10.20, so maybe I'll stop at about 11, and then we can have some, some Q&A, right? right? So I, well, I think you have seen this. I think many years ago, we had the Sen Mandala in BGF2, right? Right, we had Sen Mandala. Now, I, I think a very important, a very fundamental teaching of the Buddha, as for many of us who have actually understood Buddhism, is this principle of impermanence, principle of change. All right? So again, we can look at impermanence, look at change from a very negative perspective. We can also look at change from a very positive perspective. One of the, the things that I that found most inspiring was what His Holiness the Dalai Lama said. The beauty about impermanence is that everything can change, which means that even your negative emotions, your negative actions can change. That's very positive, isn't it? That means we can change our negative uh, emotions. We can change our negative actions. We can transform our negative actions into virtues. And that is possible because things change. So we can look at change from a positive perspective. So likewise, we grow old, we change. So can we look at our change process, our aging process from a positive perspective? All right, from a positive perspective means from a Buddhist perspective, what is the purpose of, of life? And you know, you have, you have heard uh, met in, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama saying, what is the purpose of existence is actually to find happiness. And then we ask ourselves, the Buddha says the first noble truth is there is dukkha, there is suffering. So let us not be a cause. Let us not create the cause for the suffering of other people. How much, what can we do to create conditions for other people to also have happiness besides ourselves? All right. So you can look, look at that in a very positive way. So everything that 
that, that, you, that you get from the Dhamma teachings, you can actually look at it from a very positive perspective. All right? So that, so likewise for age. I think, who was it? Mark Twain? Mark Twain, you know, Mark Twain. He says that, what is age? Age is an issue of mind over matter. Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. I think that's a, that, that's, a, that's a very wonderful way of looking at it from a very, very positive perspective. Yeah? Okay. So, sense of time. So, the, the Tibetan mandala, the Sen mandala, right? they create the beautiful man mandala. At the end of it, the mandala disappears. The, the mandala gets broken off. So, it's re reflective of our process. You know, we are born, we are healthy, we are youthful. You know, as we go middle age, we also get mid middle age crisis, <laughs> as you get older, you know. So all these things, you find that the Buddha talks about it. So the Buddha is someone who does not try to hide reality. And many of us who, who practice uh, meditation, what is the purpose of practicing meditation? Is actually to see things as they really are. Not to see things from, uh, you know, from a, a vow vision, but to see things as they really are. So that's a real purpose of, uh, we say, insight or vipassana. So that's important. So aging. So we're not going to look into all, all those theories about this. So, but you can you can look at it from a philosophical aspect, both from a scientific knowledge. And I'm not a doctor, so I wouldn't be able to talk to you too much about that. But let's look at it more from the Buddhist perspective. Yeah. So what is aging? So just a flip side. So this is defined as a gradual decrease in physical and mental capacity, growing risk of sickness, and ultimately death. And later, you'll find that in the Buddhist teachings, talk about birth, old age, sickness, and death. Things that you just can't, can't escape from. The United Nations consider old age to be 60 years or older. Right? So I'm definitely in that category now. <laughs> and I think many of you are too. All right? But the US and WHO set old age in Sub-Saharan Africa at 50. This lower threshold stands by a different way of thinking about old age in developing countries. I was listening to a talk by Wang Gungwu. You know, you know who is Wang Gungwu? Uh, the, he was an ex-Malaysian. Eh? He says we have many ex-Malaysians, good ex-Malaysians. I think he's now an Australian. Australian, I think. I think he's 93 years old. And he was, he was talking in one of his uh, lectures. He said when his, dad, when his dad was 50 years old, his dad was telling him, son, papa is getting very old. <laughs> and that was when, when, when the father was 50 years old you know, and, and he was a, a young man. And today, Wang Kung Wu is 93. All right? so, and he's still very active. Right? He's still, I think he's with ANU, right? Australian National University. So at 93, all right? of course, he, he, he doesn't divide people. Right? Some other people who is 93 tries to, tries to divide society, but I think he tries to bring, bring society together. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we shall not delve into that. All right, we shall not delve into that. No clear definition. So there's no clear definition of who is typically an older person, right? There's no clear definition. So Wang, Wang Gungu is a good example, right? Children. Some 80 year olds have physical and mental capacity similar to many 30 year olds, and other people experience significant declines in capacity of much. Many, I think Victor knows uh, uh, Jonas. Remember Jonas? who used to work, work for Ericsson, he was here, and he used to come to DJ. He's in Sweden. He just sent me a note. He's already in his 60s. And he was telling me that his parents, they are learning dancing. His parents. And he's, he's our age. <laughs> My age, rather. So people in developed societies, they, they, they see life as, as, as positive. All right? And some take music, all right, and uh, later I'll show you a show you a book called the, the Good Life, Robert Waldinger, the Zen priest, the Harvard psychiatrist. He wrote a book called The Good Life, and and he's saying that he and his wife have been married for thirty six years. They are learning new dance steps, new dancing steps. <laughs> so you can look at life in a very positive, if you want to. Okay, so aging in Buddhism. So let's look at some what the scripture says about Buddhism. Right, so. The Buddha, as I said, was right to the point. He was very direct. He, he doesn't beat around the bush. Right? So he says, what is aging? Sacha Vibhanga Sutta. This is in the Majjhima Nikaya. He says, uh, 
whatever aging, brachypetial, brokenness, graying, wrinkling, decline of life force, weakening of the faculties of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called aging. So it's a process that we all go through, whether you like it or not. Yeah? So that's just one. Then once the Buddha emerging from meditation said, warming his back in the Western sun. Then Ananda, the, the Buddha's uh, uh, attendant, went to the Buddha, bowed down, massaged his limbs, and said, it's amazing, Lord. It's amazing, it's astounding how the blessed one's complexion is no longer so clear and bright. His limbs are flabby and wrinkled. His back bent forward. That's a discernible change in the faculties. The faculties of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. So here you have Ananda making this statement. All right? Did the Buddha say, and um, before that, you remember in, the, uh, in another sutta called the Dona Sutta, and uh, when, the, when Prince Siddhartha just became enlightened, right? he was walking, and then there was this uh, Brahmin, I think, Brahmin Dona, he was approaching and he saw, and then he passed by this, this, this person. He didn't know he was the Buddha. So serene, so elegant, so majestic looking, walking. Right? And he paused and he asked, he turned around and asked, Who are you? Are you a um, Deva? Said, I'm not a Deva. Are you uh, some, some spirit being? Are you a Yaka? No. Are you just a human being? No, I'm not. A... Find the Buddha. I said, I'm the Buddha. Right? And he used the analogy of the lotus. But that was when he was young. I think probably when he was maybe in his early 30s. Right? 35, 35, 35, 36, 35. This could probably have happened towards the end of, of his life. Right? Mahaparin Nibbana Sutta. Right? So that's the way it is. Ananda, when young, one is subject to aging. When healthy, subject to illness. When alive, is subject to death. <laughs> I remember during COVID, during one of the talks, someone asked Bhante Agachita, why are people dying from COVID? His answer was, because we are born. <laughs> so it reminds me again of my first, first thing that I learned. So uh, the complexion is no longer so clear and bright. The limbs are flabby and wrinkled. The back bent forward. There's a discernible change in the faculties. The faculty of the eye, the faculty of the ear, the nose, the tongue, and the body. This is what the Blessed One said. Having said that, the well-gone, the Sugata, right? just now you recited the nine virtues of the Buddha, the well-gone one, he just said further, I speak on you, old age, old age that makes for ugliness. The bodily image so charming is trampled by old age. Even those who live to a hundred are hated, all to an end in death which spares no one which tramples all. So this is from the Jara Sutta. So here you find a very explicit, very clear description of reality. Right? Sometimes people say, oh, why is the Buddha talking about all those things? But this is just the beginning. Remember the four noble truths? This is all related to the first noble truth. People make the mistake of only holding on to the first noble truth and forgot about the third and the fourth noble truth. So we must not make that mistake. So what you are listening here now is basically an explanation or an expansion of what is generally... Uh, regarded as the first, maybe the second noble truth, first and the second noble truth about dukkha, about suffering. All right. So as we go on, you'll find that the Buddha actually provides uh, solutions how we can actually overcome this. Okay, so this is in the first discourse. So so that we, we know all these are from the from the Buddha's words himself, right? So I think in any Dharma talks is I always believe it's very, what is more important is not what the speaker has got to say, but what you can learn from what you can find from the scriptures, because that's where the, the, the final authenticity is. So I think if you cannot remember what I said, it doesn't matter, but just remember where these are from so that you can, after the talk, you can go back and then you can do further research and understanding. So this is from the first discourse that the Buddha gave, the very first discourse when Prince Siddhartha became the, the, the Buddha, for those who are new. So this is called the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, setting in motion the will of the law. So this is addressing the, the, the five monks, right? The bhikkhus, bhikkhus and monks. Now this bhikkhus, for the spiritually ennobled one, 
is the true reality, which is pain or dukkha. Uh, translated as translated as pain or dukkha. Pain, uh, birth is painful. Aging is painful. Illness is painful. Death is painful. Sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, unhappiness, and distress are painful. Union with what is disliked is painful. Separation of what is like is painful. Not to get what one wants is painful. In brief, the five bundles of grasping few are painful. So the final sentence here, the final word here is, is what is the most significant. We are going through this process of aging because of what is called the, the five bundles of grasping. But we will not go into detail, but that's the five aggregates. All right, This mind and body. This mind and body. Because we have a mind and a body. All right, so that is why we cannot escape from this. So the Buddha stated right from the start for us to understand that. Because you, you will also understand that when we practice the Buddha's teaching, we have what is called the Eightfold Path, right? And what is the most in, in, important? In fact, he said that it's like, like the sun. And that is right views, isn't it? You may be the best meditator. You can sit for hours. <laughs> you may have attained great jhanas. But if you don't have right views, you don't have wisdom, all right, that's not going to get you out of samsara. All right, that is why the Buddha always emphasized the importance of having right views. Samaditi. So views are very important. We get our views wrong, we are in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> all right. Okay. So views means understanding. Like, for example, when you have right views, then you look at things you know, with wisdom, you look at things with emptiness, right? uh, or with compassion. So all these things are boiled back to, to having views. Okay, so this is, so we know that this is something that the Buddha mentioned, right? Okay, so what is important now is, having understood this, what can we learn from the Buddha's teachings? How we can uh, you know, uh, live, our, live our life happily? After the, after the Buddha says, he has only one purpose, which is to teach us the nature of existence, which is dukkha, and how to get out of dukkha. Isn't it? If you look at the four noble truths, the third noble truth we usually translate as the end of suffering, isn't it? And end of suffering is usually equated with nibbana. And nibbana is one of those terms which is so difficult to translate. Um, we always talk about happiness, so bliss, nibbanic bliss, happiness. So the Buddha's aim is actually how can we find happiness in our lives? Okay? So there are five things here, reflections on aging. So five things maybe we can try to, to, to contemplate, try to reflect, and see how we can relate it in our everyday life. Okay, So these are the five things. The first one is accept reality of aging. You have, you have, I've shown you two or three uh, suttas, from the Ajara Sutta to the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. So how do we then accept the reality of aging? Oh, yeah, was, I thought this was an interesting one. You know, at, at a Dharma Talk, a student once asked Suzuki Roshi, you know, Su Suzuki, Shunru Suzuki, not DT Suzuki, Shunru Suzuki, the one who wrote the Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center. So during one of his talks, he says, you have been talking on and on about all those complicated Buddhist teachings. You know, sometimes we attend a Dharma Talk, you know, how many thought moments make one thought process, you know. You know, you talk about these jhanas, you know, first jhana, second, then third, fourth, you know. And then you got a form jhana, as if there's not enough, you got formless jhanas. So, whew. Then, so probably he was talking about, you know, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Zen perspective. So finally, one of the students says that the, it's too complicating, all those teachings, I don't understand what you're saying. Is there something you can tell me that I can understand? So finally, Suzuki Roshi took it quite seriously. He waited for a while and finally he says, everything changes. If you can understand that, you understand the Dharma. <laughs> okay. You know, there's a very beautiful this discourse. You know, one of the things that we, that we, that we, we learn uh, as we grow older is always to, to, have, to do meritorious actions. Isn't it? Always to do meritorious actions. And sometimes you hear people say, what are meritorious actions? Well, of course, supporting a center like BGF is very meritorious. Printing Dhamma books is very meritorious, right? Highest, you know, very, very meritorious. Uh, you know, making, uh, making Katina offerings, those are fantastic, those are very meritorious. But in that sutta itself, 
on the highest form of merits. Do you know what the Buddha says the highest form of merits? What is the highest form of merits? It's even higher than offering food to a tzanka. Don't get me wrong. All those things are meritorious. Huh? I'm not saying those are not meritorious. But the hierarchy of merits, the highest is when you are able to perceive anicca, when you're able to perceive impermanence. <laughs> right? So in that, in that discourse on the hierarchy of merits. So Buddha says the highest merits that anyone can get is when we have a clear comprehension, understanding of impermanence. Because when we understand that, we have right views. So that's linked to right views. So that's the most, that's the highest form of merits that, that we can. Okay? Having said that, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, that uh, doing dana or kakina is not, not merit. They are meritorious, definitely. Right? But ultimately, because you do a lot of good merits, uh, kakina or you know, build temples, good. We'll, we'll get good rebirth. All right, good rebirth. All right, but you are still caught in this cycle of birth and rebirth. You are still not out of samsara. Right? It's only when one comprehends uh, the nature of existence as anicca that then we are able to go. Okay, so this is why Suzuki. So you, you find that this concept of impermanence is found in all traditions, not only in the Pali or Theravada tradition, even the Zen tradition. So it's a universal, fundamental Buddhist teaching, right? Which I think we, we can all understand. So. A very important discourse here. There are five things. Again, I think all of you are familiar. This is from the Upajatana Sutta, Book of Five. Right? The Buddha tells this not only to the monks, but also to lay people. He says there are five things we should every day contemplate. Right? The first is, I'm subject to aging. I've not gone beyond aging. So as I said, the moment you are born, you are, you are actually aging. I'm subject to illness. I've not gone beyond illness. I'm subject to death. I've not gone beyond death. I, grow, I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. And finally, I'm the owner of my actions as to my actions. Now, you look at this. Uh, Achan uh, Tani Saro has a very good article on this. And he explains, if you look at this, you, you, you analyze this, you contemplate this, the first four things are telling you what is real. You can't run away from. You can't do anything about that. Can you? You can't. But, but, that's where hope for all of us is the fifth one. Is the fifth one. I'm the owner of my actions as to my actions. So, and that's karma. Is it? That's karma. So what you do will make that change. While the first four, you, well, you are born. <laughs> you can't say, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be born. You are already born. Can you tell your, yourself, I don't want to fall sick? You can't. Isn't it? That, that's the basis for, I think, the Anatta Lakana Sutta. Isn't it? He said, can you tell yourself, please, don't fall sick? You, 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 you can't. <laughs> you know, I, I just came back from Sydney. And, uh, and uh, before that, you know, I went for my flu jab. I went from my pneumonia jab. So I was, I was very confident, you know, no, I'm not going to worry anymore. No need mask. So I went to Sydney, came back, did the normal stuff. Two days before I was supposed to come back, I, I had flu. <laughs> I had flu. Despite the jab. All right, despite the jab. So I can take the approach, why me? <laughs> but then that's natural, isn't it? Right? So then I had a chat with my doctor. He said, Oh, I told you I, I was just joking with you. I said, oh, how come? Hey, I just got a flu jab. No, I, now I'm still got flu. Yeah, you're lucky you had a jab. Otherwise, you'll be dead. <laughs> uh, he was joking, obviously. So, illness, sickness, you can't run away from. You, 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 you can't, right? And then death. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, many years ago, there was this movie called The, the Green Mouth. Is, you know, maybe some of you have watched that movie, uh, Tom, Tom Hanks. Oh, great, Tom, Tom Hanks. It's Tom Hanks, the, the character, he, you know, for some reason, he, he could not die. <laughs> By the time he was, I think, in his 120, 130 years old, all his friends have died. His, his relatives have died. His children have died. All his loved ones have died. 
Can you imagine the misery, the suffering that he, he goes through? You see? So that's not natural. So death is natural. That's why in Buddhism, we talk about meaningful death, we talk about natural death, we talk about happy death. Right? When Lama Konchok, right? maybe some of you know Lama Konchok, uh, the, the great Lama, uh, Geshe Tupten uh, Tenzin's uh, teacher, the, the, the one who came out in the movie called The Unmistaken Child. I think we, we showed that. When Lama Konchok was about to die, all the, you know, the, the, the disciples, they were all crying, oh, great Lama, Lama, great Lama, why, why must you die? You die? Who's going to teach us the Dhamma? And Lama Kon, Konchok, very feeble, just trying to scratch his head and say, why are you guys crying? Don't you want me to, you know, to come back? in a more useful way and then teach you Dhamma? And he said, I made a promise. When I come back, I'll make sure I can learn English to teach you English, teach you Dhamma in English. Because he was telling Geshila that when he travels to, to, the, to the States, he gives a lot of teachings to the States. He has to give in Tibetan and translate into in English. So he made this strong aspiration. When he passed away, when he comes back, he wants to learn English. And true enough, of course, Lama Kokoncha, as you know, he was reborn and Geshe Tenzin uh, Zopa brought him to Queensland. Yeah? Queen, Queensland learned English for many years. So, you know, so this can be seen from a very positive manner. Right? So you, you, can, you, can, you can look at all these great masters. The other one which I find very inspiring is uh, Master Ying Shun. You know, Master Ying Shun, the, the great, uh, I think, Su the, uh, the, the the nuns, uh, master, right? Master Ying, 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 Ying Shun, the one who, who actually uh, translated a lot of the Chinese agamas. You know, in, China, in Mahayana Buddhism, somehow they tend to only focus on the later traditions, like Lotus Sutra, Amitabha Sutra, Lankavatara Sutra. I mean, those are great sutras, don't get me wrong. But they seldom go to the early uh, equivalent of our Pali Nikayas. You know, there's an equivalent called the Chinese Agamas. So, like, for example, you have Anguttara Nikaya in Pali. So, you have got Ekotara, uh, you know, uh, Agamas in Sanskrit. Right? So, so, Master Ying Shun was the one who, who actually uh, created a lot of emphasis on, on, on doing that. Savastivadin, yes, yes, yes. And thanks to, to, to that, I think scholars like even Bante Sujato and Analayo. So now they are studying the Pali scriptures in comparison with the Chinese agamas. And the beauty is, you find that there's a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities. So that brings me to the point that the, the Buddha's teachings, uh, you can see the consistency. Whether it is from the Savastivada, as Brother Victor mentioned, or from the Pali Nikayas, or the most recent one, we find it in the Gandharas. Uh, thanks to Richard Solomon, right? Professor Richard S Solomon, they have now discovered you got the Gandhara sutras in the Gandhara language, and one of the very famous sutra, the Kaga Visana Sutra, the Rhinoceros Sutra, where in a Pali tr tradition, the uh, Rhinoceros Sutra, the Kaga Visana Sutra, is found in the Sutta Nipata, one of the oldest part of our Pali canon, and that is found now in the Gandhara, Gandhara Sutra. So you find that as 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 we you know as 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 we develop, right? so new findings actually adds credence to actually the Buddha's teachings, the similarity, the consistency of the Buddha's teachings. Okay, so remember this four thing. I think all of you are familiar with it. I just want to highlight one thing, which um, what um, Achan Tanisaro. I think Achan Tanisaro is coming to Malaysia, right? You, do you do you know that? You know, he's giving some teachings with Achan King. In, I can't remember the dates. Uh, yesterday, someone was telling me that. So, so he, he was saying that, uh, look, the first four, well, is, you really can't do much. But the fifth one, I'm the owner of my actions, as to my actions. Uh, this is very important. Yeah? Even in the discourse called the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutra, the lesser discourse on Kama, Buddha emphasized a lot on this. That we are heirs to our karma. All right? Or as Bhikkhu Bodhi says, what is karma? Karma means every action has consequences. So we must have that right view. So that right view is very important. Very, very important. If we have that right view that every action that we do, 
whether through our body, through our speech, or through our mind. All those actions, which the Buddha calls chetana, intentional actions, they have consequences. All right? And what are those consequences? That's a topic for another talk. <laughs> we don't have time to go into that. So I'm the owner of my actions as to my actions. So why is this important? Because as we, as we get older, as we age, um, I don't like to use the word as we get older, even when we are in our, even when, if they are teenagers, you know, as, as you grow, I think we should always be aware of, of this. Not only wait till we are old. <laughs> okay? Right. Let me go on. A reminder. So teachings on the reality of old age sickness and death are called Buddhism, that aging in reality doesn't sound all that nice. Isn't it? it doesn't sound nice at all, right? It may come as possibly morbid. But the point is to remind people of the nature of reality. Everything ages and eventually passes away. So it is true for every human being who ever lived, whether one is rich or poor, powerful or powerless. Right? You look at the annals of history, where are all the most powerful persons today? They're gone. They are no more around. Right? So, the, so the, the first one is accept reality. The second, the second point of how we can learn to, uh, to, to live you know, mindfully is to learn to let go. Right? Now, of course, again, this is not something new. I think everybody knows about it. So here, I just want to mention that there was a research done in this published in this magazine called Science uh, that two experiments suggest that one key to aging involves learning to let go of regrets about missed opportunities. <laughs> These are research done. Right? A key determinant of our emotional well-being as we age is to learn to stop worrying about what might have been in the past. Right. So can, can, can we do that? Now, this is an advice. Now, of course, this is from, from the science, scientific research. Right? And I think from the Buddhist point of view, uh, there's, it also lends, lends, lends credence to that. Right? Well, this is from Snoopy. Right? <laughs> Snoopy says, one of the happiest moments in life when you find the courage to let go of what you can't change. You know, you know, in my in my years in in the corporate, you know, one of the things that I always uh, like very much that I share with my with my team is this phrase from Stephen Covey. All right, areas of interest, areas of areas of concern, areas of influence. Areas of concern, areas of influence. We can be concerned about many things. All right. Just as I think, rightly, we can be very concerned about the war in Palestine. All right. We can be concerned about the war in Ukraine. All right. We can also be concerned about the, the number of homeless in San Francisco. <laughs> you can be concerned about all those things. But do you have an influence? Can you influence the change? If you can influence the change, by all means do it. So don't just talk. Don't just... <laughs> Be concerned and then do nothing about it. You can do something, do something about it. So I think that's a very powerful lesson, right? From but that's not from the Buddha, that's from Stephen Covey, right? Don't, don't say that's from the Buddha. Then you got fake quotes, fake Buddha quotes. <laughs> but there's something from the Buddha which is very similar to what the, the science research tells us. This is from the Badirakata Sutta, right? Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not yet been rich. And this is a Buddhist word long before uh, any scientific research was done. <laughs> Instead, with insight, let him see each presently a recent state. So we talk about the, the, the present state of the our present state. Is it? When we talk about mindfulness, it's actually living in the present, isn't it? Right? Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly unshaken. So the Badekarata Sutta, well, it's a long sutta, it's not just these two paragraphs, but I've just ex ex extracted this. It basically tells you that what has happened in the past has gone. You can't do anything about it. What is yet to come, you also have not, you, you really do not know. But what you do now can make a difference. That is why the first slide in the Upajatana Sutta, the five things for us to reflect, the first four, you can't do much, right? But the fifth one, you can change. And the fifth one is what is meant by this here, right? 
for the past with the left hand future has not been reached, each presently a recent state. That is why when we talk about mindfulness, we also talk about live in the present. We live in the present. You take care of the present, the past will take care by itself. Right? And how do we how do we take care of the present? We make sure that we have we create conditions. Remember, karma is it has got effect, right? So we create conditions so that whatever we have done in the past, we do not know, right? We have no influence, right? So we create conditions that will allow wholesome actions that we have done in the past, we may not know, create positive conditions for them to arise, right? In Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, when you meet a Mahayana monk or a nun, they always say, let's create affinities. Let's create positive affinities. So in others, each time when we meet each other, we try to create positive conditions, positive causes that will lead to a rising of wholesome actions that we have done in the past, we do not know. We do not know what we have done in the past. If you do the reverse, <laughs> you're going, you, you, you break your precepts, you, know, you, you, you harm people, you cheat people, you know, all right? Then what is happening is you are also creating karma, but you are creating conditions for activities which you have done in the past, which are negative in nature, to arise. You see, karma works in, in such, 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 a, such a manner. So that's the, that's the intricate nature of karma. Nobody really knows, except the mind of a Buddha, how karma actually works. But this is just some, some example. Right? So, Always remember, we talk about the present state. So let us think of what we can do to create causes for positive actions to arise. Right? So you can think, what are the positive actions? Okay? So it's called live now. <laughs> so learn to let go. Now, this is again from another sutta. So you see, the Buddha's teachings actually is not just about how many thought moments make one thought process. <laughs> but it's actually about how we can actually lead our life. You know, one of the things and another early teachings which I always remember is from this book by the, the late Narada Mahathera, the Buddha and his teachings. In those days, it was a huge book and that was about the only Buddhist book that, that you have right? those days when I was growing up. When I was first in the, and he said that in the Dharma or Dhamma in Pali, <laughs> there is milk for the baby and it's also meat for the adults. Of course, he's not a vegetarian, so we use the word meat. So don't, don't get offended. <laughs> Sri Lankan monks are generally not vegetarian. <laughs> so while there's milk for the baby, there's also meat for the adults. So which means that the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, we can apply at every stage of our life. Okay? So now this is a very important discourse. is 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 actually used even in psychology. You look, pick up some Buddhist uh, books on, on psychology, it says the first arrow is the physical pain. The second arrow is the emotional reaction to the first, first, uh, first arrow. The first arrow is inevitable. It's part of being in samsara. The second arrow is not inevitable and is preventable dukkha. So it's optional. Again, you go back to the five things. The five things. Yeah? Birth, old age, sickness, and death. Let's take sickness. If we fall sick, all right. I gave an example. I, I felt sick when I came back from, from, from Sydney. Obviously, I was, I was weak. So the first arrow that shot me was the, the flu. If I don't understand the Dharma, then I'll be shot by the second arrow. I'll say, what a... Use maybe, you know, I put a use those words. What the heck? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I paid so much for the flu jab, you know, and I come back. Why can't other people get, get flu? Why me? Why must it be me? You know? And then, I'll, I'll, and then I'll, I'll be so, you know, so agitated. I'll be so upset. You know? so, but I told myself, you know, since I'm going to give a talk on this, I better control myself. You know? <laughs> I'm going to give a talk. Bobby asked me to speak on talks. So I better remind myself. <laughs> better behave myself. You know? <laughs> so I told myself, well, I've already got the first arrow. So let me not get the second arrow. Because the second arrow is how I react to, react to, to that. Isn't it? So it's not easy, but I think as we learn, learn, the, learn the Dharma, as we slowly, you know, all right, we can. Okay? The first, all right, so, so you know, I, I just give you all these short snippets so that I want you to reflect on it. And then after that, 
hopefully you will Google Salata. Salata means arrow. It means arrow. So there are two arrows, right? Okay. So the third one is uh, Vision of Life. Now, this is from the Pamatupama Sutta. It's from the uh, Book of Connected the Discourses. So this is what the, the Buddha says. I tell you, great king, I announce to you, old age and death are advancing upon you. So he tells it very direct to the king. Uh, I don't know if whether here people would tell that to the king, <laughs> but that's what the Buddha did. <laughs> he said, old age and death are advancing upon you. Since old age and death are advancing upon you, what would you do? You see, did the Buddha take a very pessimistic perspective? No. He did not say, too bad, you know, you are getting old, that's it, your life gone. <laughs> he said, no. Did the Buddha say, sir, what can I do? But practice the teachings, practice morality, doing skillful and good actions. You see, even when you're old, you know, it doesn't mean that only when you're young. So when at every age of our of our life, you know, so we should always have this vir vir what, virtuous actions, virtuous thoughts, right? Like the who is that? The, what, what is the famous uh, the, the Chinese saying? Uh, Think good thoughts, what, say good words, and do good deeds, right? Is that from Master Singing? I think. Right? Think good thoughts, always think good thoughts, say good words, and do good deeds, body, speech, and mind. Right? I'm not sure it's either Su Chi or Fo Kong Shan. Right? They always say, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> but it's good. Right? We can, I, I don't think it's copyrighted, so, so we can all use that. Okay? So we can all use that. So what can I do but practice the teachings? Practice morality, doing skillfully, and good actions. So Sila, isn't it? This is Sila, this is, uh, Akus, uh, this is Kusala, doing what is ku Kusala, and Kusala Kamatana, the good actions, right? So we do all those things. The fourth one is to respect the body. While contemplating the repulses, of, now I just highlight this because you may ask this question, so I preempt it. So while contemplating the repulsiveness of the body is considered to be a powerful remedy for sensual attachment, this is a therapeutic perspective that is not necessarily intended to carry it over into other areas of life. Okay? You'll find that uh, there are 40 objects of meditation, different objects of meditation. Not every teacher will ask you to practice repulsiveness of body, isn't it? All right? For example, if, if you are very strong sexual urge, maybe that is a that, that, that's a good. But if you don't have that, you know, maybe other methods like uh, mind, like uh, maybe loving kindness, compassion, you know, that may be more. So that's why the Buddha is always skillful. Right? One of the nine appetites this morning we recited. The Buddha is the incomparable teacher of gods and men. Sata Deva Manusanang. Remember, we recited it this morning. Sata Deva Manusanang. He's a teacher of both Devas and Manusa. Ma Ma Manusa is a term, Manusia, <laughs> Malay word Manusia. So he's a teacher of gods because he knows what is best for each one of us. Okay? So, uh, okay, so in contrast, the Buddha does speak of the value of the body in the context of the preciousness of human birth and the value of a healthy body along the spiritual path. Right? In the, in the Tibetan tradition, if you study the Lamrim, for example, the Lamrim is called the gradual path to enlightenment. The first teaching that they have actually is not an affordable truth. The first teaching is always on Four, yeah, four things that turns the mind towards Dharma. What are four things that turns the mind towards Dharma? The first one is precious human birth. Once you understand the precious human birth, you understand that this precious human birth is so fragile, so impermanent. That's the second thing that turns the mind towards Dharma. And once you understand the second one, then you come to the third thing that turns your mind towards Dharma. That is, you understand the faults of samsara. You understand that samsara is not the place you want to be in. It's like Lama Zopa says, if we are in samsara, nothing is perfect. What do you expect? <laughs> you expect per perfection? You, there's no perfection. Right? So you, you understand the faults of samsara. And finally, you understand that you can get out by understanding the law of karma. You see? So the four things that turns. But why did we start with the precious human life? Because we have got this body. Right? You got this body, and this body is important, right? And in fact, when we do our meditation, we have mindfulness on body. 
Why do we always have mindfulness? Because I, I, I like this response that John Amaro gave when he was asked, why do we always use the body as a start? He said, because your body cannot move. Your body cannot move away. Your body will always be there. <laughs> Which I think is an excellent answer. Isn't it? If I start with feeling, oh yeah, before I think my, my feeling is gone somewhere. But the body, the body is always anchored there. Right? Right? So I think that's, that's always a, a very good uh, reason why the Buddhas start with uh, kaya nupasate. Kaya nupasana, kaya nupasati, right? Starting with the body, so that is important there. So don't get don't get this wrong when you hear about this repulsiveness of body. Those are methods, right? The Buddha gave a lot of methods, all right. And sometimes different methods suits different people. For example, how to overcome um, anger, how how to overcome uh, delusion, how to overcome greed, for example. The Buddha gave five different methods. Right? Remember in the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta? Remember this discourse? Vitaka Santana Sutta. Buddha talks about five different ways how we can get rid of and not one way. Because there are different methods. So, and it suits different people. Right? So, how to remove distracting thoughts? That's the name of that discourse. Sutta uh, Vitaka Santana. So, please Google that. Vitaka Santana Sutta. How to overcome distracting thoughts. So the, all the Buddha's teachings is about how do we actually apply these teachings, not belief applications, right? So this is another example, okay? So respect the body, right? Precious human life. No, even in the, maybe I mentioned Tibetan tradition, but in the, in the Pali tradition, in our Theravada tradition, I think there are two very important discourses. One is the Chigala Sutta. Chigala Sutta. The other is the Deva Dahas Sutta, where the Buddha gives the analogy of the the, the blind, the one-eyed turtle who lives at the bottom of the seabed. Remember this, remember the story? That the turtle once, uh, I don't know, 100 years, or, you know, floats up to the top of the surface of the water and it's one-eyed blind, you know? <laughs> and then there's a yoke, there's a hole there. So what is the probability of that turtle, one-eyed blind, coming up from the bottom of the ocean once in 100 years, putting the neck into that, into that yoke there? Of course, if you are an actuarist, I think you, you, you can cast the probability <laughs> that is possible, right? But very, very different than it. Right? I think Bobby in insurance, you know, probability, right? But the, but the key is that uh, it's very difficult to be born as a human. So the fact that all of us here are humans, I assume all are, uh, no, no, no devas in a in, in human form, right? I, I mean, all of us are, are, are humans, right? So in, this body is very important, right? Important. Okay, so body and meditation. So body is central in the practice of mindfulness of breathing. In breath meditation, we develop a full body awareness that provides the foundation for developing all the other factors needed for awakening. Right? As I said, the satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. Right? So to watch feelings in the mind, the body is a firm host in the present. So I've, I've used Achan Amaro's explanation to, 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 to phrase this. Otherwise, our desires can pull us in all different directions. So with the body as a pose, we can understand the full working of the mind. So again, it's a skillful method. It's a skillful method. Right? Doesn't mean that everybody must, must, must do, do this. You may have another teacher who is very skillful in maybe uh, Chitta Nupasana you know, or Vedana Nupasana. So he, he or she will teach you in a different, different approach. Right? Okay. okay. The last one is be positive. <laughs> and this is found also in the in the, in the it's gone. So I, you know, I, I had to find where they are from so that you will go, go back and, and, and find. So this is from Anagata Bayani Sutta. So there are five things here also. Before this unwelcome, disagreeable, displeasing thing happens, let me first make an effort to the attaining of the as yet unattained, the reaching of the as yet unreached, the realizing of the as yet unrealized, so that end up with that Dhamma I will live in peace even when old. So you can see that uh, just like the last discourse the Buddha gave right, on mindfulness, Right, that in order to don't give up, even you have not achieved what you 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 set up to achieve, right? Still, you know you 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 continue. You, you know the story of Ananta Pindika, right? We all know Ananta Pindika attained the first stage of enlightenment, right? First stage. So he wasn't fully enlightened, and when he was uh, about to pass away, he was uh, very ill, and I think it was Sariputta who came to to give him a teaching. So Sariputta gave him a very <laughs> profound teaching on the on the five aggregates, on the five khandhas. Of course, he, he, he was so filled with joy, you know, so filled with joy. Right? 
And at that point, what did Ananta Pindika tell Sariputta to do? He said, he said, Venerable Sariputta, Bhante, what you have given is so wonderful. It has benefited me so much. Please share these wonderful teachings with other people. So even at the moment when Ananta Pindika was almost dying, you know, his thought of kindness, compassion, that other people can also benefit the Dhamma. Isn't that an excellent uh, and wonderful uh, gesture, isn't it? Right? So even when we are very old, we are very sick, we can still have that, 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 that kind of, uh, of, uh, of kindness. Uh, so we have to cultivate that. We have to cultivate that. Right? So make it like a second nature. Okay? And again, there are techniques. <laughs> there are techniques. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, always encouraged his students that every morning when you wake up, when you wake up, first thing you, 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 you do is you open your eyes, you know, wish may all beings be well and happy, you know, or you have a little shrine, you know, go there, say may all beings be well and happy, may, may they be free from mental suffering, may they be free from physical suffering, may they be well happy. And he says that if you do it constantly enough, long enough, it becomes second nature. Right? It's what in our Pali tradition, we call it, we cultivate what is called anusayas. Anusayas, this word anusayas means habitual, uh, habitual actions, habitual karma. So how do we cultivate positive anusayas? You can also cultivate negative anusayas, right? Every morning you wake up, what the heck? What is an, a Monday again, you know? You know, oh, you know, I'm going to go off it. I'm going to meet this crazy guy again. You, you can have, a, you know, you, you, you have a choice, right? Is it? You have a choice, right? So that's why the five things for us to contemplate, the fifth one, what Achan Tanisaro says, you have a choice. You make that decision. Okay, so remember that. So I will live in peace even when old. So Ananda Pindika is a good, good example. <laughs> okay. And of course, you can say Ananda Pindika is a first stage, right? But the, there's another one called, I think it's mentioned here, ah, Nakula Pita. You know, the, 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 I'm not sure if it's also first stage, but there, there's two, the, the, the father and the mother, but the Nakula Pita and the, I think the, the wife is, uh, I can remember, maybe Makula, I think, on Nakula. So this is Nakula Pita Sutta, where the Buddha told this householder called Nakula, he says, when you are, when your body is suffering from disease, when your body is sick, you must constantly train that the mind does not suffer from disease, that your mind must not be sick. So, and this is what, what modern medical science is talking about, isn't it? psychosomatic. Remember the term psychosomatic? When we first heard the word psychosomatic, we didn't know the Buddha already talked about it 2,600 years ago. <laughs> Buddha already talked about that. Right? Only in the 20th or late 19th century, people talk about psychosomatic. That's what the Buddha says. You, you, when your body is sick, do not let your mind be sick. Isn't that a wonderful uh, therapeutic kind of thing. So we can grow old, it doesn't matter, but uh, as we will grow old, we will fall sick. So let's have that back. So I also read this book, uh, well, if you like, you can read it. I just, it's Alan Leginger, because this book talks about the mindful health, right? Um, this is not a Buddhist book, but many of the ideas are very, very uh, in line with Buddhism, right? Uh, she, she, you see, I just read to you, I just extracted this. He said, our beliefs and expectations impact our physical health. That's what you heard from the Buddhist teachings, right? As much as diets and exercises do. As we grow older, our physical limitations are largely determined by the way we think about ourselves and what we are capable of. Thus, we need to challenge our socially constructed, implicitly learned assumptions around health and aging in order to take control of our own well-being. I started by sharing with you what Wang Kungu talks about his father 50 years ago. So if we have the same attitude as Wang Gungwu's father, then I think we are, we are asking for a lot of problems. Right? That, that is why during the Buddha's time, I always like, like to see this like, a, like a, a very humorous. You know, at what age did the Ananda become the Buddha's attendant? 55, right? So I tell myself, that's why at that time, our retirement age was 55. Because at 55, you're very old. So the Buddha you know, needed someone attendant 55. For many years, right? Our, our, our retirement age in Malaysia was 55. Then we became 60. Now, now say 60, right? Uh, 60. But in Japan, for example, uh, it's 65. And in, in Australia, in UK, in US, no retirement age. 
you know, <laughs> no retirement age. <laughs> right. Okay, so so this is an interesting book. So what I'm trying to show you here is that as you if you engage into science, for example, you find that a lot of scientific findings are just corroborating what the Buddha had discovered. That's why today you have a, a group called the Mind Life Institute, right? Mind Life Institute in, in, in the States, right? So you Google that and find a lot of very interesting things. Okay. Uh, I just, um, just a, a few quotes which I found very interesting. Now, this is from, you may or may not know him. This is, uh, this is Daisaku Ikeda. Ikeda is the one, you know, Soka Gakkai? Uh, so, of course, Soka Gakkai, some people say it's controversial, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I just want to say what Ikeda says, right? He said, Do we view old age as a period of decline ending in death or as an ascent toward the attainment of our goals, toward bringing our life to a rewarding and satisfying conclusion? A subtle difference in our inner attitude, keyword inner attitude, can completely transform our experience of these years. The final outcome of our life is determined by how we live our final chapter, how we bring our life to completion. Life loses its dynamism from the moment we lose the passion we wish to live with. No matter what our age, we cannot afford to let the flame within our heart grow dim. We do not become unhappy because we grow old. We become unhappy only when we grow ever more unwilling to change as we age. So even Ikeda talks about change. So if we cannot accept change, that's where the problem starts, right? I started by showing you the Sen Mandala, which is about change, all right? So Ikeda, who is, uh, some of you may, may not regard him as a, as, you know, as a, as a mainstream Buddhist, but even in, in Soka Gakkai or in, in Nichiren Buddhism, change is inherent in the practice, right? So, I just want to end by introducing you this wonderful book. Have you heard of this? Have you read this book? This is a fantastic book which I read and uh, I was so excited. And when Nalanda asked me to give a talk, I actually spoke about this. <laughs> but Nalanda Buddhist Society, not, not Nalanda, it's Bihar. Nalanda Buddhist Society. Now this book, actually what I find interesting was because uh, Robert Waldinger is a Harvard professor of psychiatry at the same time, he's a Zen Roshi. You know Zen Roshi? Roshi is the Japanese word for Lao Tzu, I know, the, 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 the Chinese Zen master. Right? So he, he, in his free time, he teaches Zen. When, when he's not teaching Zen, he, 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 he teaches at Harvard. And, and he did a study. This, this study is actually uh, lessons from the world's longest study on happiness. It started in 1938, right? And it went down, the, the original group. And, and then you've got the, I, I think the, 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 the parents and then the children. Then they include the spouse, right? And what is interesting is the conclusions. And uh, I was reading an interview, Tricycle. Tricycle is the Buddhist magazine. Right? Uh, James, James, Shaheen, James Shaheen, the editor, was interviewing uh, Robert Waldinger. I said, what is it that in Buddhism, was there anything in Buddhism that actually uh, influences you, you know, in, in, in this research? And he, and, and he said that uh, he's not sure what Buddhism influenced him, but one thing he learns from this research, which he finds very similar to what he learns in the Dhamma as a Zen Roshi, is that the, 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 the thing that makes a person grow and live healthily, happily, is Sangha. Now, of course, in the, in, in the West, when they use the word Sangha, they don't mean the monastic Sangha. They like Tingyat Han. When they say Sangha, it means layman, laywoman, the community, the fourfold community, which we think we, we, we use the word Parisat, right? Parisat. So we don't use the word Sangha in the, in the strict Theravada sense, right? But in, in, the, in, in the Western Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism, when the word Sangha, it not only means monks and nuns, it means the community, right? Sangha. So, so this, this book is, is, is interesting, right? Uh -huh. This book reveals that what makes a life fulfilling and meaningful is relationships. And he says the importance of friendship. And uh, during the, the, in his research, he, was, he asked some of the research. He said, he asked them, anyone here who, for example, in the middle of the night, if, if you've got a terrible emergency, is there someone that you can call? 
that someone you know that if you have an emergency, you can call someone. And he, and he found there are some people who have, some people who don't have. And those people who don't have, they live a very miserable life. Because there's no, there's no relationships there. And, he, and when he talks about relationship, it doesn't mean your spouse, it could be your friend. It's somebody that you can relate to. Right? So I think it's a very powerful uh, teaching because the Buddha once told Ananda in the Upada Sutta that this holy life is not half the holy life is friendship, but the entire holy life is comprising of friendship. Remember? In the Upada Sutta. That's what the Buddha told Ananda. Because Ananda initially said, oh, Bante, Bante, I think, you know, I just discovered, I think half the holy life is about friendship. <laughs> Buddha said, no, don't look, Ananda. Please don't say that. It's not half the holy life. It's the entire holy life. Right? And the Buddha knew that. Buddha told Ananda 2,600 years ago. Unfortunately, it took Robert Waldinger 2,600 years later to, to discover this in his research. <laughs> in this Harvard study. Right? Okay. So to put it in Buddhist terms, a good and meaningful life is made with Sankha. We found it in our research that if we wanted to predict what was going to stay healthy and be happier and live longer, there are two key predictors. Those who took care of their health and those who stayed healthier and were happier were those who had better, warmer connections with others. Good relationships predicted well-being over time. So when our good friend uh, Eddie Koo came, came back from Perth, he was, I think, Victor, myself, a few of us, we were, we were young, very young at those, those days. <laughs> but he's back here. So, you know, it's, it's really great meeting up. You know, it's like uh, good, good, good friends. Huh? And this is testament to the Buddha's uh, teachings about the importance of friendship. Right? So we should cultivate this, this importance of friendship. So, for example, this community. Right? I think we are all Kalyana Mitas. Right? We are friends. So it's very, very important. Okay, so I just want to end by this lecture which His Holiness gave in, uh, in Freiburg in 2013. Freiburg? You know Freiburg? That's where I, I got my cuckoo clock. <laughs> you know the cuckoo clock? Yeah. I got my cuckoo clock <laughs> in Freiburg. <laughs> Beautiful place. <laughs> but one, one, came, one day didn't work too well. <laughs> anyway, if our mind is trained, physical suffering that comes with old age won't disturb us much. So that's the key. If our mind is trained. Right? So it's what His Holiness says. We should have the determination and motivation to develop calm, love and compassion. So how do we train our mind? We train our mind with wisdom. We train our mind in love. We train our mind in compassion. We feel our minds, as we say, with anusayas, with those positive thoughts. Right? We need to be equipped with internal skills. I think earlier slide, there was one where we talked about internal skills, right? So I think this is what is meant by the internal skills. Right? To develop internal resources. Those are resources from within us, not from outside. <laughs> okay? DGF cannot give you those skills. DGF can provide you an, uh, what, what they call a location or an opportunity for us to develop this. Right? Otherwise, if we are used to looking for pleasure in the sensorial world, when we grow old and lose our ability to perceive sight, sounds and smell, it becomes difficult. Isn't it? I think it's so true. And His, His Holiness is just telling a fact. Because whether you like it or not, we're going to lose our sense. You know, you know, uh, Brother Eddie knew we had, uh, we had lunch with some you know, friends, nine of us, you know, and, and one of them was already having hearing aid. Yeah. Alzheimer's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Alzheimer's. Yeah. You see, so that's natural, is it? So, so, we, we, so we, we look at it in a positive way. Yeah? Because, uh, so otherwise, if we are used to looking for pleasure in the central world. Okay. So this is another book if you are interested. Yeah? I, I've not read this book, but I, I, I've read some reviews about it. I think it's pretty good. Uh, this is by this, this guy, Louis Richmond. The author acknowledges the fear, anger, and sorrow that many people experience when they must confront the indignities. Of their, yeah, of their aging bodies right? and the unknowns associated with mortality. Right? He guides readers through the stages of aging as well as adapting to change, letting go of who we were, embracing of who we are. Right? Who we were is when you start remembering when you were <laughs> in your 20s, in your 30s. You know? right? as, as, as sometimes we used to joke, you know, hey, we are no more uh, 
spring chicken, you know. So you cannot you cannot behave like that. <laughs> All right. He guides readers through the stages of aging as well as adapting to change, letting go of who we were, embracing who we are, and appreciating our unique life chapters. Okay. So I just want to conclude with, with this, but uh, uh, I think what is important is uh, if I really would like you to read this book if you can, because this book tells you three other things which I don't have time to mention. He says that for us to lead a very meaningful life as we, as we progress, three things very important. One is always cultivate a curiosity, having a curious mind. That's the first one. The second one is always to cultivate generosity which we all learn, isn't it? Dana. And the third one, he said, is always to be adaptable. Now, the first one, curiosity, you know, he's a Zen practitioner. So in, in the Zen tradition, we have a phrase called a beginner's mind. A beginner's mind. Shunru Suzuki wrote a book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. In that book, he says that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the mind of the expert, there are very few. You understand that? Actually, I, I shared that same quote with my leadership team in Japan a couple of months back. These are my, 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 my GMs and CEOs from around the world. And they asked me to say something, so I, I quoted them this, this, this phrase. And, and, and they say, yeah, it's so true. Because even in, in corporate learning, you, know, you, you have to understand, the moment you think, I know, you actually do not know. You have stopped learning. So Zen mind or beginner's mind is when so remember what Shunru Suzuki says. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. But in the mind of the expert, if you think you already know everything, there are very few possibilities. Okay, so curiosity, having that, that, that curiosity, that, that, that one thing to learn. You know, like for example, you know, the, the Pali Canon is such a wonderful resource. All right, so there's so much we can learn and how do we put it into practice? So that's one. Then the generosity. Generosity, again, does not, does not only mean what uh, Robert Walden just says is doesn't only mean giving money. You know? Generosity can also mean mental generosity. In others, let's not be so judgmental of people. Be more forgiving. Exactly. Be more forgiving. That's generosity. So don't think generosity is only about giving money. <laughs> generosity is about not being judgmental about people. Be forgiving. Give people a second chance. You know, in that sense. And the third one is, of course, adaptability. <laughs> okay, so, and, 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 and again, we, we know if we don't adapt, we'll end up in the, in the Jurassic Park. Okay. okay, so I conclude, and I'd like to conclude with one more advice, not from me, but from Lama Atisha. You know Lama Atisha? The one who reformed Buddhism in Tibet? In his classic uh, Garland of the Bodhisattvas, he gave this advice to all of us, which I think I want to say it because I want to remind myself. So sorry, I want to say it to, to you so that I will be reminded myself. He said, when you are in the midst of many people, when you're in the midst of many people, always check your speech. When you're, in, when you're alone, when you're alone, always check your, check your mind. I think that's a wonderful advice. And I like to say this because I want to remind myself. <laughs> so I want to, to say, so Lama Atisha, right? Atisha Dipankara, Atisha Dipankara. So he says that when in the midst of many people, when you're in many people, be careful what you say. Speech, right speech, Buddha talks. But when you're alone, uh, when you're alone, always check your mind. Because nobody knows what you, what you think, but you know what you think. <laughs> you cannot run away from that. Okay, so I think that should be enough, right? So it's all, almost done. Okay, so, sorry I took longer than I should. Right? My, my, my apologies and uh, wasn't too mindful. that. The, but the clock keep on ticking. I, I just wanted to share with you these last few things. Thank you very much. Yeah.